703 really just goes on to explain the concepts brought up in 702. We don't need to spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's worth at least going over. 703 reads, the facts or data in the particular case upon which an expert bases an opinion or inference may be those perceived by, by or made known to the expert at or before the hearing. Put this, someone explain that language to me in context of Rule 615. Give you a hint. 615 is, is the sequestration, constructive sequestration of witnesses. So, Can you repeat your question? 703 <laughs> reads, the facts or data in the particular case upon which an expert bases an opinion or inference may be those perceived by, in other words, the facts that they rely on can be perceived by the, by the expert or made known to the expert at or before the hearing or trial or whatever. So does that mean if an expert was allowed to stay like in the courtroom during another person's testimony, they can base their fact on that testimony? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what 703 means. It means that sometimes in the course of the year, the affidavits will be changed a little bit. Sometimes an expert's opinion will be changed. Sometimes they'll go through the entire year by saying, it was probably this guy, it was probably this guy, probably this guy, and then they change, their, then they change one word in there, and it says, probably not this guy. I don't really know how that's relevant, but if you have an opportunity to, and you can, you can bring out, you can cast doubt on an expert's opinion based on what has already come out in evidence, if they have not been sequestered, constructively under Rule 615, then you can legitimately ask them, uh, you were present throughout today's proceeding, isn't that correct? You were present when Mrs. So-and-so testified. You were present when she testified that she saw the car going north. And you were present when Mr. So-and-so testified, and you were present when he testified that the car was going north as well. Yet you still claim that the car was going south. Stop it there. Your point is made. Two people said north, he says south. It's going to be up to the jury to make the determination. But that's the way that you can use an expert opinion in the context of, of 615, using evidence that has already come out in trial if the, if the expert has been present throughout the proceeding. So that's the first sentence of, six, of 703. Um, and the, obviously anything that they learned or reviewed before the, before the trial is also a proper basis for their expert opinion. The second sentence reads, if of a type reasonably relied upon by experts in the particular field informing opinions or inferences upon the subject, stop. Someone explain that to me in the context of Fry. See, it wasn't a worthless little tangent. Is it because not, not the whole industry relied on the life factor test? You couldn't exactly testify on that because there's no standard for it. Right. This is a vestige of the 1923 Third, Third Circuit Court of Appeal case, U.S. v. Fry, or Fry v. United States. This is it. This is where they're saying, all right, for 50, for 50, for like 90 years, we've entrust, we've, we've believed that there's at least some credence given when other experts reasonably rely on the same sort of facts or data in formulating their opinion. So now, we're not going to strike that. In fact, we're going to codify that in Rule 703 and say that that can be a proper basis for an expert opinion. Okay, next sentence. Um, if uh, in formulating opinions or if it's upon the subject, comma, the facts or data need not be admissible in evidence in order for the opinion or inference to be admitted. You can have an expert that reads a whole bunch of inadmissible hearsay, speculation, improper opinion, inference on top of inference, just completely objectionable stuff. And they can still give their opinion. The catch is that the underlying facts or data may not be able to, may not be disclosed to the jury. So, if you have, the way this would work is, when the expert is testifying earlier in the direct examination and saying, this is how I formulated my opinion, this is what I relied upon, this is what I read and reviewed in anticipation of today's trial, you can object to all of that. And suppose that you kept all of that out on the grounds of speculation. 
Well, that doesn't mean that the expert can't give their opinion. All it means is that the jury conceivably is not going to hear what they based what he or she based his opinion on, and therefore it's going to go to the witness's what? Wait. Credibility. Credibility. The likelihood that he or she is right. If you think about it, it's King Solomon splitting the baby. Only this time he actually cuts the baby in half. Like, this is the judge saying, all right, look, you don't want the opinion in, you want the opinion in. Your opinion is based on crap. So you don't get, you, you'll keep out the crap, and you still get your opinion in. That's the compromise that this rule makes. If you have a, a really, a really, um, a really light opinion, it's called a light opinion. It's just not based on, on substance. If you have a light opinion, the opinion comes in, but the underlying facts may or may not be disclosed to the jury. And that's what the next sentence goes on to say. Facts or data that are otherwise inadmissible shall not be disclosed to the jury by the proponent of the opinion unless the court determines that their probative value in assessing the jury to evaluate the expert's opinion substantially outweighs their prejudicial effect. What does that remind you of? 403. Now, what's the problem with that and 403? Read it critically. And I mean critically. The language of this says... It's the opposite. It's the opposite, exactly. 403 is when the danger of unfair prejudice substantially outweighs its probative value. 703 imposes a reverse 403 balancing test and says that the probative value in assessing the jury to evaluate the expert opinion substantially outweighs the prejudicial effect. It's the flip. You have to understand that distinction. You have to argue it correctly. The general rule for prejudice is danger of unfair prejudice substantially outweighing probative value. In 703, it's a deeply tech, it's a highly technical, borderline useless rule in your context. However, if you bust it out right, big points. Big points. This is UVA stuff. This is NYU stuff. This is the this is the kind of objection, these are the kind of objections that they make, and this is why they perennially win. Because they're that damn good. If you can get yourself to a point where you understand the rules at this level, you don't need to make stupid relevance objections here and there. You pick your battles, five objections for your team throughout their case in chief. Five solid objections. Five well thought out, beautiful, handcrafted masterpieces. You're going to win. You will win because no matter what you do, the judge is going to sustain two at least of those really big, of those five really big objections. And these are the kind of rules that you make other people look like retards for not knowing. You make them look stupid by wiping the floor with them with these rules. And it's understanding the subtle distinction in 703 that can really make you shine. So, that's that. Any questions on that? Did you know that? Not to that degree, no. Neither did I until I read it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding.